we are here in Samui watching a lot of changes, um, watching the changes in the jungle, the changes in our own behaviors and minds. And then as we look at the world today, noticing that indeed there are still some currents of change happening, just as we were getting used to being confined People around the world are beginning to uh, loosen some of the changes that were made. And so now there are new changes that are just disrupting all the habits we've acquired during the old changes. So we started thinking it might be a nice topic to talk about how the process of change um, and the arising of habitual patterns or routines in response to our lives, uh, how those routines are upset when change happens. Um, and when you look at change, you really, uh, with a mindfulness kind of practice, and you look at what change is all about, it really is the process of the gunas acting on the gunas, where uh, there is a state and then the state might perhaps be tamasic, sort of dull and not much happening, or s steady and sort of still and not engaged. And then that process gets booted into action by something, um, usually. And that is when the rajasic uh, sort of guna comes on the scene and boots the, rajas the tamasic pattern into action. And then um, those two synthesize, and a state of sattva happens. So in the changes we've seen where there was lockdown, we were all panicked. Um, that was a sort of rajasic thing that happened. And then... Kind of tamasic. The, t yeah, demanding tamas. And, and, then, and then we all got so nice and comfortable in this state of lockdown. and. Uh, for a while, there was some potential sattva, but there was also a lot of unease and disease and uh, concern and anxiety. And so the sattvic feeling never really sank in. Um, and now, again, more changes are happening. Um, so what we recognize when we look at this process um, in from the perspective of a mindfulness practice um, is that this is going on around us all the time, whether it's in our minds, whether it's in the world as a whole, whether it's in our garden or in our case in the jungle and we watch you know, incredible changes overnight to uh, plants or animals that are insects that come in one night having been born and that, that's it for them one day. Um, and, and so this process is ongoing all the time. And we find ourselves in a state of being in this sea or this current of change and infinite change. Um, but also within that process of change, there is the potential for stability as well as insight, um, and when we apply the mindfulness practice to our own state of being uh, within the process of change or just within the process of being, we recognize that it too is, is a pattern, a wave pattern, just in a way like so many of the other aspects of being and of life that we encounter. Um, we can start recognizing what is it that actually sort of defines our state of being. And the way to really look closely at that is to bring mindful awareness, attention to the process of being. Mm. That things, and, and, and we talk about them in mindfulness practice as they are the five empty heaps. Oh, yeah. So there's a great uh, thing that everyone should memorize. In fact, 
that's your homework now. Um, it, it's quite well known. It's called the Heart Sutra. Uh, and if you don't understand it completely, um, that's actually a good sign when you first read it. Anyway, the, uh, in it, uh, Avalokiteshvara, uh, the Bodhisattva, of great compassion, looks down and uh, he, they say he looks down from above and he sees but five empty heaps, or panchaskanda. Uh, and another term you'll find in uh, many texts that are not Buddhist, but also in Buddhist, is gana. Uh, and so a skanda or a gana just means a pile, or a, you know, just like a trash pile, or uh, one of my favorites is like a, a pile of salt. Uh, because if you have a pile of salt, if you uh, taste it, you know, on the corner, it tastes just like salt. If you dig really deep into it and find the innermost grain, it's still just some salt. And so it's basically a heap uh, which has no particular order, and any point in the heap is just the same as all the other points. And so it's considered a pile. Um, and he saw but five piles, and this was that's all there is to see or experience anywhere is these five piles. And they're very interesting. And the parallels to the Yoga Sutra are just... Uh, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, it's like, who's reading whom here? Um, but the first pile is called Rupa. Uh, and there's a special sense. Rupa just means form in general. But in the sense of the Yoga Sutra, Rupa means... Uh, that aspect of experience that we all share, like the earth, like um, nature, like the environment, uh, history, all of these things that if I'm not paying attention to it, that doesn't really matter, it's, it's not going away. It's probably more my little embodiment that's going away. And so that which we share, uh, like the environment is considered to be that kind of form. And, and that's the first heap. Uh, and when he saw that, uh, and he was looking, and he noticed that uh, if you look really closely at form or the shared, that which we share, that it is shunyata, it is empty of swabhava or self form. Um, and then, he, he was noticing that that form is emptiness, which we immediately, we bow down to, oh, emptiness is the answer to everything. And we're saying, no, no, emptiness is form, and form is emptiness. There's no difference between, you couldn't find that, because there's swabhava shunyam, meaning empty of any kind of separate self. Okay. And so, oh, Okay, so already you should be going, <laughs> what are or. you talking about? <laughs> okay, and then he says, but the same is true of Vedana, uh, which means sensation or touch in the sense of prana uh, in the Yoga Sutra, or that which is, so we in initially think of sensation as, you know, touch throughout the body or patterns of touch throughout the body, but also um, it refers to sensation in, as sound or as sight or taste or smell. And so, and so sensations, normally we translate as the different pranas, or, uh, they are also shunyata, empty of any svabhava uh, or self-form, any independent, if you look really closely at them, there's nothing you can find that is separate or distinct from their entire background, which is everything else. It's like, and so we'd say, oh, it is empty. Uh, but that emptiness, that Vedana, that sen pure sensation, is emptiness. And the emptiness is the pure sensation. It's not like a dualistic thing at all. Like, you're never going to find shunyata. Empty. And then, well, what's the next one? Oh, and this follows this 
chain of flow of how things arise in our minds, uh, sangya is the next empty heap. And sangya is, we all experience this, when you, you have those rare moments where you're just going, ah, ah, you know, to be, what do you say? And you're just experiencing sensation, and all of a sudden the mind uh, tags it, puts it into a category, uh, nama. Puts uh, a label on it. Puts a little label, and it's not necessarily, usually not a linguistic label, mm -hmm. where you go, aha, that is a frog wagging my toe or something. Um, but it's, it's just like rec a recognizing of it, uh, and it doesn't have to be on uh, the verbal kind of language thing. It's kind of more like uh, an embodiment language. But as soon as it's tagged, then you, you're paying attention to the tag and no longer to the sensation. And if you look very closely, you realize that in, in a meditation practice that, that it is the tag that makes it and your, your uh, interference in the flow of this process of being by putting that tag on that pulls it out of its background. And yeah, that makes you no longer pay attention right. to this uh, to this internal threat to sensation. And but don't worry because uh, all of the, the sangha is swabhava shunyam. It is uh, it is emptiness itself, and emptiness is the sangha. So no one there to worry about, huh? Okay. And then what happens is a big one, um, that you don't experience directly, but somehow we, we understand it, and it's called samskara. Uh, and samskara is the habitual and, and we believe embodied or placed into whatever type of body you have. Uh, samskara is kind of the collection and the habit of mind, uh, and and it's triggered by the, the, the process tag. of naming, by the process of yeah, putting the, the tag. tag on. Yeah, as soon something. as it's tagged, then all of a sudden that activates something, and I think metaphorically and perhaps actually, it activates something, you know, that's below our the, our conscious awareness, um, and then boom, a chitta vritti comes up. And of course this is the, the basis of yoga, that you have samskara and then vritti is what appears. And then the vritti reinforces the samskara and adds to it, you know, maybe, you know, it's like a piling up of, you know, and then more vritti, more samskara, more vritti. And so the, the final heap after the samskara is called vijnana. Uh, which, and this means specific intellectual activity or intelligence. Um, um, a kind of wisdom, but it has to do with functional uh, mm -hmm. wisdom. So it's the, the possibility of the everyday awareness uh, mm -hmm. of, of things. You know, our favorite story, our favorite drama, um, or whether exciting or boring or good or bad. Uh, and so the, but the vijnana, uh, the vijnana skanda is completely empty of any separate self. There's no, if you look really, really closely at that, you won't find anything or anybody. It's like, there's, it's all connected to everything else. So it is, emptiness, and emptiness is it. Um, and, and what happens is the, there, believe it or not, can be confusion that arises in this process of, of <laughs> observing these five empty heaps because within the process of, of 
being unfolding in this way, um, the process of experience unfolding. Um, there is this tendency to want to know and to want to um, check out of the uh, discomfort that we mm -hmm. feel when we think, well, you know, if everything is empty of self-form, if everything doesn't really, is all interpenetrating, how do we navigate in this process? And so um, what we want to talk about a little bit today is the process of how samskaras arise and how um, they influence our behaviors as well as our mind states and um, and how we can uh, sort of look at them in the bigger context. One of the things that seems really important to remember, if we're thinking back to the beginning of this talk where we were talking about change as a process also. So you have this process of change happening and in the process of change, um, form arises. So rupa, the first thing, you know, presents itself in some way into your steady state of mind. And in that process, you know, then the, the process of, of tamas, rajas, and sattva is going on whether or not you uh, interact with it or manipulate it. Mm -hmm. And what happens when we um, can relax into the concept and the actual embodied feeling of, of mental perception and embodied perception of this idea of five heaps that mm. cause being to happen is that we can see the merging of change and the interpenetration of change with the process of, uh, of some stars arising. Mm. And with that, ability to see that interpenetration, we can then um, possibly pause long enough to step back and not um, immediately identify with the uh, mind state that might arise due to the samskara or due to the um, process mm -hmm. that we're experiencing. Uh, I, I can't resist making it. This is totally a footnote, okay? And that's a joke, by the way. Foot meaning? Foot. Foot. <laughs> meaning the hoop, uh, okay. Uh, ground. Uh, but the, the process of inquiring into the panchaskanda, or the five heaps, is part of the five heaps. There's nothing that manifests. And even my wanting to understand or not wanting to understand, these are also empty. They are shunyata also. Uh, which is, which doesn't allow you, even if you form a conclusion from that, that conclusion is also empty of self-form. And uh, that's why occasionally, you just <laughs> it's kind of like, a, uh, it's delightful. I, I, I think that's uh, the thing. But I think what we were talking about is, What's very fascinating that I come up with a lot these days, you know, considering uh, the greater predicament that uh, not only I'm in, but all of the beings I run into, uh, particularly human beings all around the planet, is this idea of samskara, uh, which are our deep, deep ingrained habits, uh, and how those are activated, and you were usually completely oblivious to their activation. And then we can end up, you know, off on some story, oftentimes not a happy story. Sometimes, you know, like, oh, woe is me, uh, or, and for possibly, you know, very uh, legitimate reasons. Or uh, we react to it, and we all of a sudden, I got to get back. I got to get back to work. This, and, uh, and and so we, the story activates, you know, a kind of lust or greed or need. And we often, in within our own practices, observe this as well as talk about it with students and see this 
too, um, that some scars really are embodied. They are, and we, Richard, you often talk about them as it's almost like they're layered. They're layers that are stuck together, layers of oh, yeah. misperception, so that when we go into a yoga practice sometimes, and this is um, something that has been happening to people these days, but also I remember vividly when 9-11 happened as well. It's sort of another um, horrific thing that happened. Um, people would come to yoga class and would, it was very difficult for people to practice. So in a time like this with change where routines are upset, where, you know, to it's tedious and annoying to even think of five empty heaps. I just want to get down to it and do what needs to happen to move on and make things stable again. Um, that it's it can be very, very difficult to do an asana practice. And with 9-11 and also in this time when there is such incredible suffering in this world where you may not know someone personally who has died or know someone who's known someone who's died, though many of us do know people who've, who've had the virus or who have died from the virus. Um, but there is this palpable feeling of suffering when you think about the fact that, that people all over the world right now, there are people who cannot breathe. There are people who are not with their loved ones on their deathbed. Um, and there is this background, uneasy feeling. Um, no matter how joyful you might feel about something else, there's this background feeling of suffering that is happening. And so when we go to practice sometimes, and especially doing backbends where we are in a very, very vulnerable position, it can feel too much. Or you might notice yourself um, doing a backbend and then having a wave of emotion arise, or even bursting into tears. That happens sometimes in a yoga practice. And after 9-11, it was almost impossible for students uh, to do backbends. Um, and part of what we see that as is this um, fact that when we are so uh, vividly moved by something like a, an event like the coronavirus that's an ongoing process that we're dealing with, the samskaric patterns that we've built up within our own embodied experience that are protecting us, that are often misperceptions where things are that really are not related are glued together, almost like the fascia is connected to the muscle and stuck to the muscle in ways. And then we do a backbend and rip apart the samskara in a sense. And so whatever we might have been holding in there is then revealed. And it can be a time of great transformation, mm -hmm. but it can also be a time where it's too much. So you can, you know, you don't have to always peel the samskaras out of your nervous system by um, doing the, you know, okay, kid, here's a Band-Aid on your knee, let's pull it off now. You can just eke it off with a little bit of water over the course of <laughs> a month mm. and, and slowly open up these uh, samskaras within the body where we hold these yeah. beliefs and perceptions that, that may morph into misperceptions. And it's really important to know that samskaras, as we learned, are empty of self-form. They are shunyata, mm -hmm. and shunyata is samskara. Um, that they're not necessarily bad things. In fact, they could be extremely useful to have some samskaras. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as as humans, um, you know, a lot of our own our natural behavior is samskara. Mm -hmm. And so there are samskaras that are extremely useful biologically. That you wouldn't survive for two minutes without. Uh, and then there are positive samskaras uh, that uh, 
you don't want to necessarily get rid of uh, because those are some scars that allow you to uh, experience um, others, you know, that allow you to uh, actually become grounded. And so it, it often takes uh, a positive samskara in order to suspend uh, reaction to uh, negative samskara. So a negative samskara would be, you know, of course, anger or, or extreme greed or extreme need or fear. Or pain. Or pain. Um, and so, yeah. an ex you know, an example that I love, that I often okay. talk about is the, the way Thich Nhat Hanh uh, talks about positive, negative, and neutral samskaras that we, for the most part, most samskaras are neutral. They are, um, you know, just relatively neutral. Then there are the positive ones that, you know, we might want to water those seeds for the positive samskaras. But then there are the negative samskaras. And the example he gives is that a negative samskara would be pain, or he, call, he says, or it would be a toothache. If you have a toothache, that would be a negative samskara. And if you realize that, in fact, there are far fewer negative samskaras than there are neutral samskaras, and actually far fewer positive than there are neutral. But if you want to sort of pad your bank account of, with uh, positive samskaras, you can at least temporarily get yourself out of a mind state that's trapped by the storyline associated with, say, a toothache or pain in your, um, mm -hmm. your SI joint or something like that, um, by focusing on something that is positive. So it, the example he gives is that a neutral samskara um, would be a non-toothache. Or for me, I have a certain amount of chronic pain, and so sometimes I am in excruciating pain, and I think, well, are my lips painful? And in fact, so far, they haven't ever been painful in that way. And so in the midst of something really horrible, if I can just shift my mindset momentarily to really feeling the sensation, which is where the samskara arises, from of non-pain, then I have this capacity um, to start shifting and watering seeds that of positive samskaras rather than watering the seeds of suffering and negative, you know, negative habitual patterns or samskaric. Right. So experience. when there's say, something that is physically miserable. Mm -hmm. And then when you stop doing it, it's like, ah. <laughs> but what I've noticed is that doesn't last for No, it doesn't, long. unfortunately. You know, it's like, it's like when you do certain back bends and you come out of them and you're going, ah, so nice. <laughs> and you're just completely the numb wonderful. Back and then four or five seconds later, um, you've moved on or you've become attached. Mm -hmm. You know, the ego has jumped in and it, it's taken that temporarily very positive samskara, that experience of, ah, it's all nice. And then it's trying to package it. Maybe I can sell this, uh, make profit from it. And then, then it becomes transformed by the ego, or the ego function into a dangerous, eventually a negative samskara. Mm -hmm. So basically the idea in yoga is that when something arises, um, like a citta vritti, which is <laughs> anything that's arising in your awareness, uh, if you're really watching closely, um, what the mind of the, or the intelligence automatically does is called pratipaksha kriya, or it creates like a, an envelope of context for it, so that it's no longer seen as a separate self but it is seen as a function. Mm -hmm. um, and then that suspends reacting to it. Okay, so I might, uh, 
you know, have a discomfort in my body when I sit to practice, and a discomfort that normally, you know, would make me grumpy. Uh, and then I would start to think, oh, this reminds me of what I read in the news the other day. And I would, you know, take off on a 30-minute rant about <laughs> uh, global politics or something. <laughs> this is all theoretical. Yeah, I right. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm actually uh, practicing, you know, in those, those rare moments, those same, same sensations arise, but uh, there's an interest, not a, necessarily an intellectual interest, but a, a fascination with the sensation that creates in the body a, a kind of a metaphorical envelope for it. And so the mind no longer has to go off on the trip. So the samskara doesn't stimulate the, uh, or the, the um, sangya, the label, the initial labeling of the sensation pattern doesn't stimulate uh, this habitual story. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so you're not feeding the samskara. And then they say it's almost like it, then the samskara uh, slowly dies away, or is almost it's starved. And uh, then you start to get a taste of what's called nirodha, or suspension. Uh, and the nirodha samskar is this taste of the, that which is too nice to even to try to describe. The taste of emptiness. If emptiness has a taste. Okay. And so that, that experience, uh, that forms a nirodha samskar. And but that still, eventually, as time goes on, that Nirodha Sanskar, I will associate through the same process with um, the history of it. Oh, you know, when I think about, you know, this, then I start to feel good. And my ego will sometimes co-opt that. And I'll turn a positive Sanskar, a Nirodha Sanskar. Eventually, I have to, like, see it, mm -hmm. see, see through it, and so that the ego doesn't co-op and try to create a separate religious self within it or make it special. So eventually I have to give up even the uh, positive, the wonderful Nirodha Sanskars. And so this is true, I think, of religious things uh, in which we empower, say, a mantra or, you know, in my own mind, oh, the sound of that bird, and uh, that's a and w normally when I hear that sound, I go, ah, you know, and I feel like, oh, nature is good, and have all of these things. And trust me, my mind will turn that, uh, what is a wonderful thing, uh, but it'll eventually ex try to exploit that, and uh, perhaps even market it after I patent it. And, uh, and so we become, you know, we have the potential to use this process of, the samskaras arising um, in a positive way, whether they're positive, negative, or neutral. Um, and we also, and in, in the way we d might do that is to maintain um, mindfulness practice. In other words, be attentive to the process of the samskara forming and arising, and whether it's an old you know, habitual pattern or a brand new kind of pattern that, that we're forming, uh, the more quickly we can come into this process of applying a mindful attentiveness to uh, witness, to almost bear witness to whatever the samskara is, then we can um, work with it and meet it and allow it to transmute um, or to surface, as, as we pointed out. There are many samskaras that are very, very helpful. They allow us to not have to think about jumping out of the way of a bus as the bus comes flying down the street towards us. It can be useful. Yeah, it's, it can be very, very useful. Um, but especially in times of stress and anxiety and fear or anger, one of the things that happens is we start avoidance mechanisms uh, or techniques that we have cultivated 
consciously or unconsciously um, over however many years. So that by that I mean things like we may find that you know anxiety is arising. We notice these you know patterns of responding to it that we could call habitual patterns, and then we just go and have a uh, drink, or we go and do a really incredibly hard yoga practice to blow the thought out of our mind, or we um, take um, external substances to try to shift and deaden the experience. And, and one thing that's particularly distressing to me is this idea of the, that, that there are external influences um, that come into play that can throw us off track and actually rather than allowing samskaras to um, sort of arise and blossom and, and uh, we allow us to feed the good ones and not feed the less good ones, the external factors or influences. I mean things that are coming from the quote unquote real from the yeah, yeah the rupa world. The rupa. Where which could be things historical yeah. There are other people um, Yeah. And it could be things situations. like you know, like things like drugs or alcohol that we deaden the experience with. Or it could be the uh, propaganda of other people or the um, the ideas of other people that then oh. shift us into a state of of more rigidity within our own um, mind states and attachment oh. to our samskara that makes behaviors. you more makes you fearful, more, more proud, more more superior, more separate, and totally incapable of imagining that you know. Things are empty of self-form. That things are all interpenetrated. Um, and and one word that I was talking to Richard about this earlier that I find really disturbing. There's some uh, languaging around um, social media and current marketing ideas um, is this idea of influencers, where they are people who you know, have fame or something on a lot of followers, let's say, and and they are taken by others, to, used to um, kind of influence um, behaviors in and influence the sort of uh, shoring up of certain samskaric behaviors of other people in a way they could be good, the people might be good, whoever this influencer is, but it is a way of uh, inviting us to, to check out and to not um, be present with what is actually arising. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been um, thinking about you know, the fact that how important it is, especially in this time of change and uh, chaos and crisis to find the roots of truth rather than to give in to the roots of storyline which can quickly come and transform into our own ideas that are almost self-propaganda uh, our, our rigid ideas that you know I am This, that, or the other. I, I can't think of an example at the moment. Oh, I am special. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or I am a failure. Or I am superior. Yeah. And, or or I'm I a am failure. terrified. Yeah, or I am any, any of these ego stories. Um, and then I, th I was just thinking that you could have positive influencers. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, um, you know, if you can help people via uh, mm -hmm. the communication of sattvic ideas that are self-dissolving, that just will leave people with the ability to look deeply at their own experience without, you know, the illusion of a separate yeah. self. And I think we that talked last time yeah. about, you know, 
being able to imagine people who are punya, um, and they would be positive inf influencers. But by labeling people as influencers, um, there is an inherent danger in those people thinking, oh, I've been labeled an influencer, therefore I'm special, and, and instead of be becoming more and more punya or, or enlightened or compassionate, compassionate kind. they become more and more separate and manipulative, they maybe enjoy. not even uh, purposely. So, and it, it's this really delicate territory we find ourselves in these days where we are, um, you know, where we are all treading on uh, loose sand and not really sure where we're headed or what's going to happen. And so the urge is to either have someone else, like a person who's like, I always think of the Dalai Lama as a punya, person who is punya, someone who really inspires me, or someone who has you know five million uh, followers on whatever it is that's in these days. They, I guess they're you know an influencer too, but you know our tendency is to um, to stop. You know even if you are in the presence of someone very very. Uh, profound, mm -hmm. like the Dalai Lama. It is really important to stay awake and to process um, your own experience um, with intelligence. Yeah, to practice. practice. To practice, yeah. Um, yeah. That reminds me <laughs> of um, there's something I found in the Yoga Sutra. Oh, it just happens, happens to, to pop up right here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's in the second pada when they're describing the uh, Ashtangani, the eight limbs. Uh, and we have just talked about the yamas and the niyamas. Uh, and as we all know, the, the first of the yamas is ahimsa, uh, which is basically non violence or not hurting. Uh, and you could spin that positively as kindness. Uh, and then all of the others, um, all the way to um, the uh, Santosha, Socha, Santosha of the Niyamas, Tapas, Vadvaya, Ishvara, Prani, Dhanani, Niyama. And then, um, Interestingly enough, these, the next three verses bring in something really fascinating. And uh, verse 33, uh, Vitarka bhadane pratipaksha bhavanam. Uh, so in the sense now, the term vitarka, which is sometimes a term that's just used for dialectical discussion. Uh, but for a lot of people, dialectics means argument. Okay? It's not like we're really interested. It just means we want to fight. Okay, <laughs> and they're willing to kill people for the, some theory they have, some metaphysical theory, I'll chop your head off. Okay, it's just, it's just craziness. Okay, so in this case, the Vitarka, um, Badhane, uh, can be uh, made by Pratipaksha Bhavana, um, or by contemplation of the opposite wing. And so the, the great metaphor is, you know, a bird, uh, if it has an injured wing, it doesn't fly very well with one wing. You know, I've watched that in the last few days, a couple of birds. But two wings, somehow it seems to work out. And so this is the uh, vitarka, the vitarka, this is the uh, proposition, and this is the antithesis of it. And they're interdependent. Uh, oftentimes the antithesis is unconscious in our minds, like I might make the proposition, I am great. And then my intelligence, uh, which is more interwoven with the body, goes, <laughs> it, it probably has a you know, little more information. And so the <laughs> counter-proposition, <laughs> I'm not so great. <laughs> and so both of those um, 
allow one to fly. Okay, and so if you cultivate the Pratipaksha Kriya with uh, negative states. Um, In other words, contemplate the opposite state. Yeah, unwholesome thoughts. Mm -hmm. So occasionally, you know, even these days, not that, remember you're not your thoughts. So in everyone, unwholesome thoughts arise, like I, I just want to like, uh, you know, I won't even tell you. You can come up with your own unwholesome thoughts. Okay. But the next verse gives you a few examples. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, vitaka himsadaya krita krita karita anubodita um, so, and I'll just read you this nice translation. The, um, we ourselves may act upon unwholesome thoughts, which are vitaka, such as wanting to harm someone, okay, or we may cause or condone them in others. Okay, so if I want to harm, say, um, someone I think is, of course, harming other people, okay, and so I might heroically, you know, I think, well, it would be nice for all beings if this one being would stop being harmful. Okay? And that might be very true. Uh, but then, what happens is I then lose my insight as to why I wanted to help others, but I just see, oh, that's the correct thing, and then I grab it like that. And then I think, well, I can't harm them, but I sure hope somebody else harms them, or somebody, you know, and so, uh, I am really obsessed with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not my actual story, I'm just saying theoretically, mm -hmm. of course. Okay. <laughs> and so even if I approve of it, uh, you know, it's like, then that is, that's going to be embodied in my subtle body. And it, it's going to be it embodied in It becomes a samskaric embodiment. Yeah, and a tough samskara. You know, mm -hmm. these are painful. Okay. Uh, we may cause them or condone them in others. And so these same thoughts may arise from greed, anger, or delusion. Okay. And so greed meaning, that's almost the positive sense. I, I need to start making some money. And that's natural. Uh, but then money then becomes, you forget why you want the money, and, and you just want money. Okay. So you just start everything in terms of money or profit, um, or anger, or even delusion. And delusion could be, uh, because I'm so afraid of the obvious truth of impermanence that is happening in the world around me, I clasp on to crazy theories, like flat earth theory, or conspiracy theories, that if you actually think about them, don't make any sense and logically would require so much more than just the infinite mystery of nature unfolding. Um, and so, and deluded. So, and they can be mild, moderate, or extreme. And so the examples I'm giving, or I'm thinking of are extreme, but mild uh, are something you might just experience in your household. Mm -hmm. uh, same kind of thing. Uh, you know, it could be, you know, a, a whole thing with a, uh, a gecko, um, uh, which we like a lot, but, or it could be with, uh, you know, one of your neighbors who, you know. Has a light that shines in your eyes. Has a light that eyes. shines in your eyes, and then you lift them up, and then you're, ah, and it'll actually trigger, you know, all of this stuff. And, the nice thing about the, the yoga practice is you start to notice, like, here I am, you know, a, a good me, just sitting here meditating, and I'm just going, rah, 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 rah. and it's over, like, very, it could be very local and trivial, or it could be, you know, interplanetary uh, problems. Um, and, but all of them, they never cease to ripen, they're always ripening into ignorance, and suffering. So meaning yeah. separateness. Yeah. Adhyana, ananta, pala. So they, into a, a, they, they ripen as a fruit of adhyana or ignorance 
and its ananta or endless ignorance and dukkha. Iti uh, pratipakshavavanam. Therefore, contemplate the opposite wing. Okay. And so even it doesn't have to be a sophisticated meditation. You can sit down intellectually and contemplate the uh, logical consequences of uh, you know, forming an extremist group that uh, has to kill off this other extremist group that rose because they were trying to kill off some other extremist group. Uh, and you start, you know, you can think about it historically, you think about it practically, uh, yeah, think or about in it the situation, environmentally. The situation you may be in now, where we are facing, you know, we have weathered some changes, we're facing new changes, um, and there is this uh, sort of feeling of trying to find your footing. And so things arise that are um, distressing or, or they cause you fear or anger or uh, detachment from others or forgetfulness that you really love the people um, who you're surrounded by um, because they have that irritating habit of chewing their food just wrong. Um, and so that kind of thing is where we can really, at this point in our storylines, um, take the opportunity and make the opportunity to practice observing um, the, the process of that happening within yourself. And then possibly, um, you know, reframing it. That would be a sort of psychological term for the, the two wings, looking for something to reframe whatever it is that is that might be causing fear or anxiety or um, distress. And rather than going with that storyline, with the samsaric um, embodied patterns that arise, just pausing, observing, and bringing a mindfulness practice into off the cushion, hmm. into the living room and the kitchen and, and you know, wherever yeah. you happen to be. Yeah. Small scale or big Small scale, scale or medium scale. Yeah. But the next verse is what I thought, oh, this is very clever. Uh, and Ahimsa prastishtayam tat sanidhau vaira tyaga. Okay, and so becoming uh, grounded, uh, firmly grounded in ahimsa, uh, creates an atmosphere in which others can let go of their hostility. Okay. And because a lot, you know, the, the samskaras the, and the stories that really upset the prana are, usually have to do with relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, even if they're imaginary relationships. So, oh, all of these imaginary creatures in the forest laugh at me, but that'll keep you awake at night. Okay. Um, or, but much more powerful, there's actual beings that, you know, you, you have a, you either want something from them, uh, and so they're not actually being held in the heart. Of course, therefore, your pranayama is very difficult. Uh, and so, the practice of ahimsa, uh, which is kindness, uh, is what's going to allow uh, the transformation. The transformation, because it allows them, it allows dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, and dialogue is a very rare thing, uh, even in the modern world, because argument is not rare, but where people actually sit down with, say, the competing school or the, the, the or the competing politicians or something. It's very rare. Um, but they actually sit down because they recognize finally they've had a little glimpse of each other that we, you know, we're really the same, you know, in slightly different sort and they start to actually communicate. Uh, wow, the potential is just amazing. And this has happened historically. That's when 
you know, these different schools of yoga have actually evolved is when they've actually communicated. It's usually in the alleys uh, between the ashrams or between the hermitages or between, you know, one valley and another of the uh, the few the few yogis, yoginis, they actually like talk to each other and say, hey, you know. And uh, they discover that, wow, you're saying the same thing with a different language. And uh, then there's the insight into the... And you can do emptiness. that even within your own mind, with your yeah. own, you know, Dis- disparate thoughts where you're you know, multiple personalities yeah, multiple personalities which show up a lot when we're isolated um, and and so that you don't fall into habitual patterns of behavior you may have habitual thoughts that arise but when you pause long enough and allow dialogue to happen with within this process then you have the opportunity for, um, for transformation, which is, is part of what happens when there is a merging with the five empty heaps and change, where transformation happens rather than uh, forcing uh, your way or some, taking someone else's stance. It is a possibility for transformation which at this point in our collective history, um, there is this sort of yearning to just let's get back, get back to normal, or this is going to be the new normal. But rather than making uh, theories about what the new normal is, um, if we can wake up and stay in dialogue with one another and with ourselves and watch this these processes unfolding, the process of change, the process of being, watch them unfolding and interpenetrating and realize that this is a great time of opportunity to, uh, to take hold and decide what habitual patterns, what some scars weren't serving the world or weren't serving you or your loved ones, and then not automatically falling back into them. Um, So taking time to be really careful with how we allow these habitual urges to manifest and transform. So you have your homework, <laughs> or heart own sutra. homework, yeah. yeah. Memorize the Heart Sutra and the Yoga Sutra, and <laughs> then <laughs> do a comparative analysis of 